going on an adventure. So there's only one way to figure it all out. Unzip the archaeology. Make it naked. We're bringing history and archaeology to the street. That's what we're doing. <laughs> what do you know about Delilah? I've only heard a little bit about her, that she sounded pretty sexy. I don't really know the story, but uh, what I remember from it, she's a whore. <laughs> uh, that she hung out with uh, a guy named Samson. Okay. Yeah, the long hair. He had long hair? Yeah, yeah and he was strong. Like you. So he, he fell in love with Delilah. You know what happens when you fall in love with a woman? And then in the night, she cut his hair, and then he was without power. She sold him out. She did, in the end. Um, the women, what you <laughs> Samson and Delilah, the immortal story of... The Samson was a Jew, Delilah a Philistine, probably the most famous Philistine. They were lovers, but the Bible says their tribes were great enemies. Today, calling someone a Philistine is an insult. You're saying they lack culture. But why do we peg the Philistines this way? In the last few years, dramatic discoveries have been made. Philistine cities excavated right where the Bible says they should be. And what they've dug up raises many questions. So, this is what we want to know. Who were the real Philistines? Why were they such great villains? And how did they disappear? This is one of the finds forcing us to reconsider who the Philistines were. This is ancient Ashkelon. It's a port city, and it's a port city mentioned in the Bible. Time of the Philistines. I mean, we're talking 600 to 1200 before the Common Era, you know, 3200 years ago. That's when the stories of Samson are taking place, David and Goliath. This, we're ancient site. And when the Philistines got here from some people don't realize they're Greek, and when they came here, Caesar right over there, they, they came here. Look at this. This is a huge, huge city. And the amazing thing is it's just where the Bible said it would be. Look at this. this is, it, it's, the gate is still there. I mean, an actual gate, probably the oldest excavated gate in the world. Possibly Samson and Delilah walked through it. They would have walked through this gate. Before Samson and Delilah or any other Philistine walked through the gate, the evidence suggests that they came from somewhere else. The Bible says the Philistines first show up around 1200 BC. But where were they before that? Where did the Philistines come from? Professor Carl Ehrlich is an expert on biblical archaeology from York University. His digs include Gat, hometown of the giant at the wrong end of David's sling, the Philistine Goliath. The Philistine people, the people of Delilah, the people of Goliath. In the general public, people think that these are Bible people, so they must be Semites. But in a scholarly community, whenever I've heard them referred to, it's always Aegean people, people from the area of modern-day Greece. Which is it? Are these guys Greeks or Jews? Are they eating souvlaki or falafel? <laughs> Definitely eating souvlaki. We've discovered that uh, when a site becomes Philistine, there's a change in diet from one in which sheep and goats provide the major source of meat to one uh, in which pork and beef are much more common. Than Philistines are eating Philistines pork. Philistines are eating pork, yes. Uh, which, again, seems not to be indigenous to that region. So they, they show up from the Aegean area, maybe Cyprus, Probably, maybe, maybe Crete. Right, yeah. The speculation is that the Philistines are one of a number of roving bands of sea peoples who plied the eastern Mediterranean world. 3,000 years ago, the sea people appeared. Delilah's great-great, great-great, great-grandparents. But what drove these roaming Greeks into the sea? Dr. Trudy Dotan excavated the cities that these sea people, the Philistines, inhabited on the coast of Israel. 
I met her in Ashdod, a modern town named after the 3,000-year-old Philistine village that once stood here. Now, something happened, a catastrophe, and there are many explanations for that. What was it? We see it's uh, in Greece, uh, the cities like Mycenae, like Tyrins, were destroyed, the famous cities with the wonderful... So 1200 around, uh, around BC, 1200 e yes. something happens, happens massive, Which, massive destruction, yes. flourishing civilization, and then something dramatic happens dramatic. to destroy, and then a dark age. Exactly. Which catastrophe forced the sea people from Greece south to Egypt and the coast of what is now Israel? Earthquake, plague, invasion? No one knows for sure. But there's one piece of evidence on the Philistines from the days of catastrophe. When they made it to the shores of Egypt, there were battles. And this is the Egyptian mural, giving us our first snapshot of Delilah's family tree. These are blown up uh, depictions made out of the only images of Philistine warriors that we have. And they come from Egypt, from the time of Ramses II, uh, 1200 before the Common Era, some 3200 years ago. And you could see they're wearing feathered headgear of some sort. They're wearing kilts, and uh, they have fringes at the corner of their kilts, which probably signified some kind of religious tassels, some kind of holy knots, if you will. This is how the Egyptians saw the Philistines. It's not much to go on. Most of what we know about Delilah's clan comes from the Bible. And it ain't a pretty picture. But why? Is the Philistines' bad rap a bum rap? <laughs> come to the Albright Institute in East Jerusalem to meet Philistine expert Professor Sai Gitten. Let's start with this. Um, they have a bad rep. I mean, people, you know, to say to call someone a Philistine today is not exactly a compliment. Uh, why is that? They were the other in the story between the Israelites and the They were the bad guys. But were they bad guys? It's very easy to understand why the Philistines are pictured in a negative way. Who wrote the Bible? It wasn't the Philistines. Right. Just how sophisticated was the Israelite culture that would later brand the Philistines as the great boors of history? Dr. Aaron Mayer excavates Philistine sites, including town sites like this one in Tel Aviv. He's helping bring the Philistines into focus. Were the Israelites Hillbillies compared to the Philistines? Um, yes, they were. Really? The Israelites were a, a bunch of disheveled, uh, barely cultured, um, people living in the hills, and the Philistines came with a, uh, with a much more sophisticated uh, culture. We're comparing their, their cities uh, compared to the Israelite uh, hamlets. We're comparing their pottery, which is much better made. We're comparing their uh, metallurgy, which is better. We're comparing their temples. We're comparing evidence of uh, political organization, evidence of military capabilities, and, you, and the list goes on and on. Yeah, so yeah. okay, so they're like, the Israelites are <laughs> coming to uh, to this place is like uh, the Beverly Hillbilly showing up in Beverly Hills. Uh, to a certain extent, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They eat on the billiard table. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the Philistines are looking at them and going, they're calling them Philistines. Is that what I just realized that? Are you telling me the Philistines were calling the Israelites a bunch of Philistines? Uh, well, probably something equivalent to that. Yes, absolutely. Most of what we know about Philistine material culture comes from pottery and small religious figurines. They show Greek influences, Egyptian influences, proving just how cosmopolitan the Philistines were compared to the Israelites. We don't know many things, but what they used for everyday life is really on a very, very high level. And only the repertoire of the decorations is amazing. I mean, maybe they were great in kitchen pottery, but maybe they weren't such nice people. Uh, not necessarily the rich and uh, those with high culture, the nice people, you know. But they what were kind power. Of they were definitely, they had power. They had a monopoly on iron. And the Israelites had to come down to Philistia to sharpen their iron, iron tools. tools. That was really a monopoly, which of course gave them a lot of power. And then they had the chariots, and then they had the military build-up. Very the, military. Very, and I guess very military. That's two Apache helicopters. They're coming back from Gaza, the Gaza Strip. 
Do you have to realize that the Bible records fighting along this very area? David and Goliath, the Philistines and the Egyptians fought here. This was the strategic route called uh, the Way of Horus by the Egyptians. And it was called Derech Plishtim, the Way of the Philistines in the Bible. And as we're talking about things that happened 3,500 years ago, we've got Apache assault helicopters coming back from Gaza, which is just down there, which was a Philistine site as well. Uh, and this was an Israelite site of, area over there. And you have Israeli helicopters coming back from that area after striking back because of a terror attack uh, two days ago. It's incredible. Around 1200 BC, technology was leaping from the Bronze to the Iron Age. Philistines were mighty enemies because they knew how to make iron. Israelites didn't. It's hot, and we haven't eaten, and the car won't start. No? It's moments like this that I think about the Philistines. Think about it. They live right here, right where we are now. And they had a monopoly on iron. It says in the Bible that the Israelites had to go to the uh, Philistines to sharpen their uh, iron tools. And I felt pretty helpless at waiting here for this battery guy. It's very similar to the Philistine situation. So the Philistines had the Israelites by the nuts and bolts. And Delilah had Samson by the, well, um, Samson and Delilah story is a very sexy story. He's mm -hmm. really like turned on by Delilah. Yeah, let's yeah. face it. And uh, I, think, I think you're turned on by Delilah. I yeah. I think Delilah. Yeah. She sounds sexy. Uh -huh. I read the Bible. I'm uh, excited. You uh, know this. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now I just want to understand this. Here's a very sexy story. You dig up and got one of the Philistine cities, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you found some giant penises. <laughs> no, we didn't find G some giant, giant pen penises. No? no, is that correct? <laughs> no, we found two uh, ceramic vessels in the shape of, uh, of penises. You did? Yep, in fact. <laughs> yeah. I'm afraid to ask, how big are they? <laughs> um, well, uh, <laughs> I would say smaller than what we would think is average today. Yeah. Really? Yes. Oh, well, I understand, <laughs> I understand now why <laughs> Philistine women are attracted to Israelite men. <laughs> But <laughs> what do you think it is, seriously? Well, uh, it probably was something to do with... You're going to uh, say fertility, right? Well, fertility, probably. I mean, because, you know, life is full of aspects of fertility. You want, you, you want to have children. Ancient religion was so interconnected with everyday life that everything you did was uh, interconnected with your religious beliefs. Just like a, a devout Jew or a devout Muslim doesn't do anything without, you know, saying a blessing before or after or connecting it to his everyday life with his worship of his God. In ancient times, that was very, very clear. And sexuality, uh, fertility, procreation was all very, very intimately uh, connected. This is an Israelite four-horned altar. I think the horns have a certain fertility significance. We talk about the bull, the horns of a bull having, and the bull is the sign of, a, of a fertility in, in, the, in antiquity. So basically what you're saying is that this has, you know, these altars, the four horns, because it's related to fertil fertility, it's the same basis as the concept of horny. It relates to fertility, that's and right. that's where the word horny comes from. I think so, yes, yes. We'd have to check it in an etymological dictionary. Why do you guys always talk in such complicated ways when you say, you know, horny people get it? It's an, yeah, they would get it, absolutely, they would get it. Yeah. <laughs> Were the Israelites and the Philistines really so far apart? Enemies are often intimates. Cross-fertilization, not just between Samson and Delilah, took place. Even the mighty Samson seems more Greek than Jewish. The Samson cycle is just so unlike anything else we have in the Hebrew Bible. We've got a hero, a, a judge of Israel, who never interacts with Israelites. He's always hanging around and, and messing around with Philistine women uh, and uh, partying and, and breaking all his vows. And it's only in his death that he finally acknowledges and mentions God and becomes this big Israelite hero. But he's always acting on his own rather than acting with a tribe or with anyone else. So there's that, that Samson really is a Hercules type of figure. And there's some people who've uh, argued that, well, maybe Samson comes from 
Greek mythology, that Samson really is a transplantation of the Greek Heracles into an Israelite context. Samson, the Herculean Jew. The Bible says he toppled the Philistine temple with his bare hands. Sounds like a miracle. But what does the archaeology say? Okay, what I want to know, you find you, there's, a, there's a Philistine temple right here, correct? Mm -hmm. And it's got pillars just like in the Samson mm -hmm. story, Yes. correct? Yes. And in the Samson story, it says that Samson was a guy like me, mm -hmm. you know, strong yeah. guy, you know, works out a lot. Mm -hmm. And then he pushes these pillars and kabloom, the whole temple goes down, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. We've got the architecture, we've got the site, we've got the archaeology. Is it fee feasible, plausible? Yeah, absolutely. You're kidding. Well, all it says is that story is not negated by the uh, the archaeological remains. To say that that proves the story, I mean, if that's no, what no, if that's I mean, what you you're if that's what you're no, I'm not into that. I'm just saying. Here's a beautiful story. Yeah. This guy is hot for this girl. He gets into trouble. They take out his eyes. They tie him to the pillars. Two pillars. He prays to God. Pushes the pillars. Kills his enemies. Here you have a temple from that time, Philistine, and what's in the middle of it? Two pillars. Mm -hmm. So it says, it's, hey, this that, is not just, this, this fits. This, this fits in very nicely with, the, with what we know about the Philistines' uh, story. I and think you guys that, always try to avoid that because you're, what, you're afraid you're going to be called non-academic and a religious no, fanatic? No. Well, first of all, I, I, I'm calling that all the time, but that's, that doesn't bother me. So pushing over the temple was possible. Is it also possible that the Israelites and Philistines weren't really so far apart after all? So the Israelites and Philistines were enemies. But there was give and take. They shaped each other's cultures. Samson, the Jew, seems a little Greek. And in fact, the Philistines picked up a few Israelite habits. I think it's evidence in, in Ekron in the seventh century that there were some Israelites who came to settle and brought their craft of making four-horned limestone altars, made possibly at Ekron, but certainly used by the Philistines. It's part of Philistine tradition. And the Philistines are adopting it. So like when Samson is with Delilah, not only is Samson taking on Delilah's kind of stuff, but Delilah's actually learning from Samson to burn incense on a fornhorn altar. I don't think we can say that because, again, Samson <laughs> and Delilah appear 500 or six years, according to the biblical history and the chronology, earlier, earlier. than these altars. There are, are no uh, altars in the archaeological record like this at the time of Samson and Delilah. Or well, maybe Delilah then wasn't burning, but her grandchildren. Or her great, great, Great great, 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 great grandchildren may have, yes. Who claimed Samson as a grandpa. Grandmas, grandpas, aunts, uncles, kissing cousins, the family tree branches out pretty quickly. Culture morphing into multiculture isn't a modern invention. The ancient Near East was always a blend of peoples. The Philistines melded with their Canaanite and Israelite neighbors. If you take the theory that the Philistines are essentially a mixed ethnic group that contains a strong Aegean element. Uh, they seem to have acculturated very quickly to Canaanite uh, material culture and language. Cultures merge, and at the end of the day, we all end up pretty much in the same place. But when it comes to how Delilah or any other single Philistine met death, we have very little archeological evidence and a bit of a mystery. I have a big problem. Uh, we found wonderful sites, but we did not find, neither in Ashdod, nor in Ashkelon, nor in the Kron, the cemeteries that belong to the cities. And this is one of the things that are very, very important. If you talk about skeleton, if about- If we found a skeleton, we knew what Delilah might have looked like. Yep, exactly. What, what, you a, what found. a bone structure was. But, <laughs> but you haven't found one yet? Uh, no, we have You'll not. You'll call me first when you uh, do? Blonde or not, I'll call you. A few decades ago, thousands of Philistine skeletons were uncovered. But they're gone now, reburied and never properly studied. What we know of ancient Philistines comes from their enemies, the Israelites. And again today, Israeli politics have silenced the Philistines. 
preventing the Philistine bones from telling their own story. Due to the um, political pressure put on by ultra-Orthodox uh, groups, there has been a, a, a statute that uh, any human bones found in archaeological excavations are not considered archaeological finds, and they have to be turned over to the, to the uh, Ministry of Religious Affairs. Um, because of respect to the de for uh, the dead. Uh, because they're, they're suspected of being a Jewish, and they have to be reburied. And that includes anything from, um, from, from uh, proto-human remains for, you know, from half a million years ago, uh, down till remains which can be proven to be um, Islamic or Christian um, you know, from, you know, from, from a generation ago. And it's, uh, it's a ludicrous situation. But you're a religious guy and you still think it's ludicrous? Absolutely. You can study your past and then very respectfully um, rebury these people. But it's another thing is to close your eyes and make believe it doesn't exist and make believe there weren't people living here. That puts us in a, you know, in somewhere in a very, very dark and medieval uh, uh, light. So on the personal level, there isn't much to go on for the end of the Philistines. As a culture, as a people, we know they pretty much disappear about 600 BC. Babylonian armies were sweeping through the land, but before they hit the Philistines, Delilah's folk wrote a farewell letter. There is a text, something called the uh, Saqqara Papyrus, or the Adon letter, which is a letter written in Aramaic on papyrus that was sent from the king of Ekron uh, to the pharaoh of Egypt, because the pharaoh of Egypt at that time was the patroon uh, of, of the Philistine cities. And it said, you know, dear king, the Babylonians have reached Afek, which is just outside of present-day Tel Aviv, about two days' march from, from uh, uh, Philistia. And if you don't send some troops to help us, we're lost. Well, the pharaoh never sent any troops, and the Babylonians came and destroyed the city. So, back to our first question. Who were the real Philistines? Well, they were a cosmopolitan culture, sophisticated and entrepreneurial, the opposite of what Philistine means today. They had superior technology, military, and political organization. And why did they disappear? Part of the reason is that in the seventh century BC, Nebuchadnezzar sacked their cities. He marched the Philistine nobility to Babylon. The few Philistines who weren't marched off to be slaves lost their national identity. They were so cosmopolitan, so open to other cultures, that the survivors, after the Babylonian attack, simply blended with their neighbors. They vanished from the world stage, and their enemies, the Israelites, got the last laugh and the last word, making the Philistines the biggest boors of the Bible. But as we've seen, today's archaeologists are rewriting that history, restoring the Philistines' reputation. Anyway, I think things went well. Yeah. You asked good questions. <laughs> uh, not always, but most of the time. Yeah.